Lead, lead, lead. What is happening? Welcome to Working Hours. My name is Simon Treen and I want to ask 1,000 lawyers, that's people in Leeds or from Leeds, over this decade, the second question that everybody asks everybody. What do you do? So, if you're in Leeds or from Leeds, then be my guest, Leeds. Email workinghourspod at western-studios.com with a short bio and some ideas about your availability. You can appear as yourself or anonymously on the show and you will have approval over what gets published from our chat. Welcome to episode 16. My guest this episode is Simon Young, interviewed over Skype on the 10th of February 2021. Simon is a chartered accountant and he is the managing partner of Leeds-based Aysgarth Accountants. This conversation is another great example of why I love doing this. Your average media consumer might think that there's not much to discuss around a profession that often gets stereotyped in media and culture as boring, but Simon and I breezed through two hours of chat for this interview. In this episode, we cover all the usual topics, and we also get into a good bit of detail on tax, accounting, and running companies. This is the final interview from and for this year, if I don't get any further guess. I want to be putting out two shows a week for this show, but that all depends on you, Leeds. If you don't talk, then no one can listen and I'll be back on the streets causing trouble, and nobody wants that. So if you're a lawyer listening to this and you think you would be able to answer questions that you already know the answers to, then please get in touch to arrange a time for us to do that. Email workinghourspod at western-studios.com. Also drop me a line if you have any queries or feedback, compliments or complaints. If you can leave a review, then please do so, and if you can leave a really, really good review, that would be really, really good. After all, it's nice to be nice, isn't it? Okay. Let's start this episode. What did you want to be when you grew up? That's a very good question. I didn't want to be an accountant. I remember saying to uh, one of my brothers when when I start applying for accountancy jobs, you know, I've got desperate (laughs) words that you kind of live to regret later on, don't you? So uh, I had no idea. I had no idea at school what subjects I wanted to do. Mm. Uh, You know, so... um, kind of choices were made based on teachers I liked and subjects that I got good points you know, good marks for and yeah. suddenly you find yourself at an end of a, an academic route and thinking hmm, what do I do with a history degree yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be a teacher <laughs> yeah and um yeah and then historians not you know there's not a million million jobs for historians are there no there aren't so yeah no I had I had no idea some people have this great plan when they're four years old and they know exactly where they're going and the route they're going to take well I'm not like that (laughs) I haven't met any of them for this so far though (laughs) although one friend one person that I was interviewing uh it was like yeah I wanted to be this and I am this now (laughs) (laughs) so he thought he says he was happy so um but I don't quite believe him and right so in terms of what you do now then well I guess you've already mentioned that by saying accountant so uh, yeah how did you get into that then in the end it's in the family um both my grandfathers were accountants yeah um my mother always said about my middle brother that he would be an accountant yeah and uh, when I finished university and the summer after that I wasn't really doing much and had been you know, overseas and come back. She sort of left me a little cutting that uh, at the Queen's Hotel, uh, a recruitment business was going to be talking about accountancy and the different leads of it. And I phoned up and said, oh, I'm a new graduate. You don't really want me to turn up, do you? He goes, no, 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 that'd be fine. That'd be ideal. So I did go and I suppose suddenly became aware that it opened up quite a varied potential career Mm. um, and that, you know, it seemed like a good idea. And uh, looking at other careers, I'm not a salesman, you know, mm. um, I think I would have struggled telling somebody that this was the best car they ever wanted and then moving to a rival and telling them this is the best car that they ever wanted, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, there was some training, which was difficult, became a chartered accountant, was inside mm. the profession, changed jobs a few times, went and worked in what we call industry. So I was like um, an accountant in a, a you know, medium-sized business that did something completely different mm-hmm. and then came back into the sector and uh, after a few years decided that I could do it better myself and set up my own my own practice and the rest is kind of history history really. 
So how was that change from, you know, working in, a, in an employed role to working for yourself? I mean, I would imagine by then you would have some clients maybe or someone that you can at least start with or did you start with nothing? No, I had a, a very small portfolio of clients that had um, followed me around for a couple of jobs I'd had and uh, I remember sitting down and doing projections as an accountant I can do and uh, thinking oh this is not going to generate enough money to to pay my mortgage and, yeah. and everything else but to be honest once he got going I you know kind of have no regrets yes it's that, that first stepping out is always a bit scary you know how's the mortgage going to be paid um how are you going to be able to do you know x y and z and all of that and mm-hmm. by offering a a good service and also by having I suppose quite a you know well a number of years experience I could look at perhaps some simple tasks and think you know sort of um, you know it's like doing payrolls for clients think, thinking well actually the, the first payroll had to do with March that was the end of the tax year and I could su- make some suggestions to them which should have been made ages ago but because it always been delegated to somebody else mm-hmm. and they hadn't pointed anything out they just processed what they'd seen but I could actually yeah think about it and say to them well we could do this and you know you wouldn't have to pay any more tax or Mm -hmm. you know and it yeah so it it kind of I suppose just offering a good service and and being there for clients and yes it's kind of multiplied out. So I had a look at your website and uh, I also I read this I've got a general book of things I was looking on the National Careers Service so I've, I've decided that I want to make some sort of research effort with people. So either based on kind of their job title or, um, you know, the industry that they're in. So um, I read this, I tried to look on the National Careers Service website for accountant and it had every other type of account, not just, no, just accountant. So it didn't have anything surprisingly to me that just said accountant. And then I read something else. So it was talk about the, the exams that you have to go through and so on. Uh, well, let, let's do that first, and I'll come back to the client relationships. So in terms of the exams, how was that to do? Did you have to go through all the exams? I guess you could skip some because you were already postgraduate. I, I couldn't. I had to do, I think, extra exams because I didn't have a Mass A level. Right. <laughs> um, things have probably changed since then. Um, so, oh, it was back in the days before the internet. <laughs> So you, you basically had to do a day's work, doing a job, nine to five, nine to half five, whatever it was. And then in the evening when you were feeling tired and exhausted, you had to get these big folders out of study books and read through things and fill in multiple choice questions and send them off. And then there was a block release. Um, mm-hmm. So my employer paid for the training and obviously still got a salary when we went up. And then you, you know, you'd have a, a week or two or if it was last course before a set of exams possibly five or six weeks and you know we'd go into go into Leeds and be lectured at and get exam practice and try and keep awake and drink horrible coffee at the breaks <laughs> be lots of other exciting accountants and uh, so yeah so it's a kind of a mixture I mean now I think they use a lot more technology and everything else like that and uh, probably don't have to <laughs> post <laughs> multiple choice questions off and hopefully do that all online but you know (laughs) back in the day so did you get any funding for this or did you did you have a workplace that was helping to fund it or did you have to pay for it all out of your own pocket the workplace I was at paid for it all but we um the trainees didn't get paid an awful lot so yeah uh, you know but yeah that they that they funded all of that and you know gave you all the time off that you needed for your your first set of you know exams and everything else mm-hmm. like that so uh, um yeah that was fine so, and how, how was it in terms of difficulty was it uh, i mean was it fairly straightforward stuff it all made sense to you or did you have any did it get to a point of being really kind of complex my a levels i did have been were history economics and government and politics so if if there were topics in accountancy that sounded vaguely like economics, I had no problems grasping it and taking it mm-hmm. on board. But when they started doing more complicated maths, then I kind of I did struggle with that. And mm-hmm. some of the things you have to learn, it wasn't that they were necessarily 
difficult, but you're just like, you've done a day's work. And yeah. the last thing you really wanted to do was any more work. <laughs> well, yes. Um, so you'd had to, you have to be kind of really disciplined and think, right, yeah. you, know, you get home, have something to eat, right, next two hours, boom, I've just got to concentrate on that, but yet yeah, still try and have a bit of a life. So, you know, it, it, it was difficult. Um, mm. And studying in the evenings after having done a day's work, it, well, it's difficult, isn't it? Because you're tired. So, yeah. It, uh, don't necessarily say it's the best model but it was the model i had yeah yeah um problem is you have different experiences so um i was working at a local fairly large independent firm of chartered accountants in leeds and i was tending to deal with the smaller well smes um, limited companies but somebody working for what's now called the big four probably was big eight at the, that then looking at multinational firms of you know businesses that they would have a completely different experience so it's very difficult when you've got one institute the institute of chartered accountants in england and wales that's offering exams for people who are dealing with small companies and then you've got people dealing with massive international companies and you have to have a completely different sort of mindset and experience and knowledge and understanding. And I don't think people who'd work for the big four could do the job that I'm doing very well, but likewise, I couldn't do their job and probably wouldn't want to. So it's, it, yeah, it, I mean, that I think is, there's just some tension in the accountancy profession about that, that they haven't, they need to address it. But every so often you hear news articles saying that auditors should be monitored by somebody else unfortunately I'm no I've been a registered auditor in the past and I wouldn't want to be one again fortunately small companies tend not to need them and it's um yeah it's a different mindset but we might get onto that later <laughs> I'll come back to the sort of client relationship thing so you've done like you know it sounds like you, you've chosen specifically to work with SMEs I mean to some degree it's kind of led by experience i guess but you know it sounds like there's a definite choice of i want to work with these smaller companies is that just about the relationships that you can have at work or is that also about being able to kind of have a a, a view into all these different types of industries and businesses i get the impression you're somewhat curious about just stuff that's happening so that you find interesting i, I would imagine correct me if I'm wrong but as a guest that if you've got a new company it's like they're doing something really interesting that would be as interesting to you as you know having the income from a new client it's like oh something else to find out about is that fair or yeah yeah no no that is I mean trying to yeah l l l learning about new businesses and you know meeting new people yeah, that, that is, yeah, definitely interesting and definitely exciting. Obviously, getting paid is very helpful as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my, my experience has always been with small and medium-sized companies. I've never worked for a, a large organisation. Um, when I was a student, I did a couple of short-term placements at Leeds City Council, and that was probably the nearest I got to working in a, um, a larger organisation. But, you know, once got a full-time job I've always worked in yeah the smaller end of you know if it were if, if industry and everything and I do like it and it, uh, yes a lot of it is about relationships but it's also this might sound a bit strange it's about helping people I, I can't remember I once heard somebody quote somebody who had said that you know m most people in their jobs like to help people mm. I mean obviously we can think of jobs like you know call centers or whatever where some of that might not be but I, I definitely do see my job as, you know, h helping, the, you know, my client, helping to keep them, you know, sort of um, with it, you know, they don't fall foul of the regulatory, you know, tax laws and rules and, you know, things that get filed on time so they don't get penalties and, and whatever else. So, yeah, so I do see that as part of the job, but, it, you know, probably looking in, people might not necessarily think, oh, an accountant's there to help me. Well, not mm. not not in a sort of a friendly, helpful, you know, sense. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, yeah, you you kind of think of it as a as an expense 
like a necessary expense for within the businesses I've got to do my taxes so I best bring an accountant but like you say you know because most for you know the basis of a firm is its accounts I suppose you know sort of fundamentally it's like if it hasn't it's about bringing money in and paying money out and it, it needs to be able to do that as effectively as possible and you can go into a business as much as just saying yeah you're all your all your filings are okay they're all up to regs and they look in order but you can also say you're spending way too much here you could make savings on that you're probably under investing in this like it might be wise I mean how much I would imagine you get a lot of input there but do you do you get listened to quite often do people encourage that kind of input as well I often say the hardest part of my job is understanding the client the main person in the business or the main people in the business and what they actually want out of the relationship. So you'll have some people who um, are very well informed and they're absolutely in everything about everything and don't really want any input. It's just there to put the figures in the right places and yeah. file the documents. And then you have other people who at the other end who couldn't care less about anything and whatever I say to them they'll say yes Simon you know best just get on with it <laughs> and somewhere in between is everybody else yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's, it's the hardest thing is you get to meet a new client a new person and it's like whereabouts on that you know sort of line spectrum. are they yeah the spectrum yeah, yeah. and um yeah it is it, it's, it's quite interesting um <laughs> I mean I remember one guy once phoned me at lunchtime and he asked me a question. I can't remember what the question was now. And I gave him the answer and said, yes, you know, and he goes, yeah, yeah, that's right. I spent all morning Googling it. I'm thinking, what a waste of time. <laughs> I wasn't going to charge him. But it was literally a yes, no answer. But, <laughs> you know, he must have spent, you know, three hours or whatever it was, Googling, searching, checking things out. And, yeah. you know, well, OK, fine. From his point of view, I understand that you know, he, he needs to be in control. He needs to make sure that advice he gets is right. He's probably just wanting someone just to confirm what he, he knew. But um, like I said, other people would just literally phone up or send me an email and yeah, yes, bing, off it goes. Uh. <laughs> so that that's kind of reminded me of something else. So I, I did um, I did a role where I was in a call centre working on stocks and shares, we're selling shares. And um, we were always told, you know, because people would ask you questions finance related related to their savings and so on we were instruction only so we couldn't tell you know we couldn't tell anyone what to buy or anything uh and then whenever there was ices we might get questions around tax so we were always like you can't say anything about tax mm. you're not qualified so i would imagine that as someone who is qualified that you need to also have some level of insurance and protection for yourself because you're taking on potentially taking on liabilities for other people is that right or oh that's opened up a whole can of worms so <laughs> sorry <laughs> no, no 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 it's a good one to talk about so let's just take a step back before i answer your insurance question the trouble with the word accountant is it's not a protected name so my wife's a physiotherapist. Nobody else can call themselves a physiotherapist unless they're a member of the Chartered Society of Physiotherapists. Solicitors, it's the same. They have to be part of, um, I keep wanting to say the Law Society, but they've changed their name since then. Um, but accountant, literally anybody could set up shop and have accountant over the door. That, that they, You don't need to be qualified. You don't need to have passed a single exam. You can call yourself an accountant and take on board clients. Obviously, anybody who's a member of a proper organisation, you know, Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales, um, Certified Accountants Association, you know, there's, a lot, there's about six main bodies. Anybody who's a member of that, they've passed some exams and they've got a qualification and they've got wrote some letters after their name. So if, you know, like myself, I'm a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants, I've set up a business, I have to tell the Institute that I've set up my own business so they then increase my fees accordingly I have to have a, a, a practice certificate in order to do that and meet certain criteria in order for the business to be registered with them and have the name so it's AIDS Garth Chartered Accountants in order to use that brand name 
um, I have to meet their criteria. One of their criteria is I have to, you know, the business has to have professional indemnity insurance. But yes, Joe Bloggs, who's just decided this morning he's going to wake up and be an accountant, he may not have any yeah. insurance. He's under no legal obligation whilst I'm under a professional and ethical obligation to have it. So yes, as a firm, Aesgarth has professional indemnity insurance. If I give somebody bad advice, then yes, they can um, make a claim on my insurance policy and um, it will get paid up. But uh, no one ever has. So that's, you know, yeah, you, you, <laughs> decent advice. Yeah. So, but um, you do have to be careful. So I'm not a, a, an independent financial advisor, so I can't advise clients on pensions or yeah. what investments to make, like whether they should buy things in stocks and shares or whether they should buy properties. But I can tell them about the tax implications. Mm -hmm. So I can have kind of bizarre conversations with clients saying, um, well, I know from your company, you're, you're not paying any pension contributions. And I know because I do your tax return, you've told me you're not doing any pension contributions. You really should have some pension contributions. These are the tax benefits, blah, 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 blah. And they'll say, well, who should I go with? So I said, well, <laughs> I can't tell you that. <laughs> I'm not registered with the um, FCA and, you know, I don't have the, the you know, the regulation, regulatory ability to be able to give you that yeah, investment advice, advice. yeah and it, so but likewise an ifa can tell them how to invest it but can't tell them the tax implications so you kind of you build up relationships with different people whether it's like um, a mortgage advisor because obviously that's regulated you know pension advisor you know and and you kind of know there's sometimes there's a, a bit of an overlap like a venn diagram and you know but you have to know which bit you, you have to stop and say no I, I can't say any more on this topic you need to talk to Bob or Harry or Harriet or whoever yeah. So is that just straightforward due diligence do you think or is it uh, I mean by the sounds of it, it it is just to keep everything kind of separated but I'm sure there are people that you kind of you can refer to refer clients to of like I know this person they're quite a good IFA or something like that but then I get the impression you wouldn't be able to have an independent financial advisor in your company because that would be a conflict of interest. Is that right? Well, no. Well, if you've got the right regulatory criteria, or you might need to set up a second, you know, a subsidiary or you know, you company, you so could. So if you've organised it the right way, it's it's fine. Yeah. So if I want to do even more exams and pass more regulation <laughs> and fill in more forms and you know get more insurance policies, then yes, you know. <laughs> If I could divide my time up a bit more, then yeah, fine. I, I could do it or I could employ somebody or go in partnership with somebody and we'd be under the same organisation or at least, you know, the same brand name or whatever. But um, if you don't, then, you you know, then, you, yeah, you just have to, you know, work collaboratively with other people. So, yes. Hmm. So, did I have another question? I really should make more notes. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> But I'm expecting to kind of improve the more that I do them. So um, I want to sort of talk about the COVID situation. So, so this time last year, would you have been working from home or would you be working in an office? Oh, gosh. So, yeah, a, a year ago, um, I was working in an office. Well, the, the office is based in the middle of Leeds. Um, I've got some staff. Then two of them would have been working one part-time, one full-time in the office with me and a third member of staff would have probably come in once a week and the rest of the time, you know, part-time they'd have been working at home. Yeah. Then, yeah, along comes COVID and then along comes lockdown. And so since then, I've tried to get into the office once a week because it's... Um, a better working environment <laughs> is my guess <laughs> well well part of it is because it's the registered office for lots of clients and so we get uh, lots yeah. of posts and some yeah. of the posts might be some bank trying to flog them services or some other firm of accountant who thinks writing to the registered office is a good way of drumming up business <laughs> and those letters just kind of go straight in the bin the tax office and company's house will write to the registered office and yeah. i need to know about those letters so um when lockdown first happened in march 2020 i just 
set up a company for a client and I des- and there were like loads of investors wanting to put some money in and we desperately needed lots of information and for some reason letters just weren't happening weren't getting through both from company's house and from the tax office and yeah. I was going online and click can you resend it resend it resend it and um, you know you go in once a week and it's that letter's not there <laughs> thinking oh my goodness you know that you know what can I do so that kind of that things like that were a bit stressful I mean obviously um, as we record this we've been having a bit of snow so I haven't been into the office for um, a couple of weeks but mm. uh, so I, I do need to get into Leeds at, <laughs> at some point but um, yeah it's, it's I mean the way I, our, our firm had been set up to be honest probably did, people didn't even realise that we weren't actually physically in the office we all had laptops we use yeah. things like Dropbox I'm a great fan of online accounts packages um, a lot of our, you know, our um, sort of software we use to prepare accounts and tax returns, we've got that on a, a virtual desktop. So mm-hmm. literally, apart from the physical phones, which used to be after a certain number of rings diverted to my mobile, and I've now got a proper VoIP system where they, we've got things on our laptops. And <laughs> I'll give you a, a funny story about that in a minute. Um, but apart from that, apart from the phones, literally, I don't think anybody would have, any client or anybody would have, known any difference of experience or communication yeah. because yeah we, we were logged on to um our own personal wi-fi as opposed to the office wi-fi it, hopefully it, it just it just flowed but um yes ha- having people scattered around leads and putting phone calls through to other people now there's um somebody who is he's emigrated to australia and um, has some properties they're renting over here wanted to, to talk to an accountant and um, my colleague who answered the phone obviously her flat must have been very cold and she was saying she had like I don't know four pairs of socks on all you know lo- loads and loads of clothes and then she put the call <laughs> through to me and I'm saying yeah I, I own the business blah blah and this person said well you better turn the heat up because I'm just uh, <laughs> it's really cold <laughs> and your colleague's got four pairs of socks on <laughs> I didn't say well actually she's in her own flat five miles away <laughs> but, yeah well you you do get that feeling when you ring places quite often there was you know especially big firms it might even be your bank you know you ring them up and you're like who who am I talking to now where where in the world am I now <laughs> yes. you, you don't know with a phone call you could be speaking to anyone anywhere now oh totally yes yeah so yeah, I mean, the last year has been, from a business point of view, um, it's just created so much work for us. I was going to say it was going to go one of two ways. It's either going to be you had a huge drop off in work because there were people panicking and not doing anything, or you've had a huge increase in work because it's like we need more of this. Well, what are we doing about this? How do we? And especially if everyone's furloughing people, you know, if they've got staff, then they'll need at least some advice on that or how to go about it, I'm guessing. Yeah, so we, we, we run a, pay, a, a payroll bureau and we do payrolls for lots of clients. Mm-hmm. So suddenly, you know, the prime minister would stand up on a Thursday and say, right, we're, we're going to pay all the wages of all the staff and the new rules be announced on Tuesday. So my phone would just go absolutely crazy. My inbox would ping with clients saying, well, how do I hold this money? And I'm saying, I don't know. Did you not hear the bit of the sentence that said, and it'll be announced on Tuesday and today's <laughs> Thursday. I literally do not know any more than you do. You know, <laughs> give me a call on Wednesday because I can, you know, time for the rules to come out. I, time for me to read them. Time for me to go onto a website that it actually can explain them to me in English. And then yeah. we can have a conversation. So there was a lot of time putting blogs up on our web website with what the rules were so when a client did email I could just copy and paste from my blog with a link and not have to reinvent the wheel all the time but then with yeah. the rules constantly changing yeah there's a lot of time updating that so none of that was necessarily you know it had to be done but it wasn't exactly help you know sort of I don't know be very sort of um uh, good chargeable time for one of a better phrase and um yeah yeah because you have this tension and you know different accountants have dealt with it differently so um how, how do you deal 
with all the extra work that so there are some accountants that say well we've not charged our clients anymore but they've done a huge amount of extra work and then there's yeah. other accountants that say well no the minute we uh, do any more work for a particular client we're going to charge them more yeah. and you can Which kind of say fair enough yeah <laughs> yes but like most people i'm somewhere in the middle and there's some businesses that have just completely collapsed but whilst i've got to be commercial i do also if i think somebody's in a position it's not not necessarily because of their fault i don't mind helping them out mm. but if i think someone's taking me for a ride i, I get very upset by it yeah. so I, you know I, I don't mind providing people a bit of assistance for you know but yeah the, the, some some clients have had a a good pandemic and some have had you know a bad pandemic and yeah. uh, you know there's uh, got one client where they do a lot of work for the nhs on a digital front and in april they did something like 75 percent of their turnover the previous 12 months mm. just because it, it i mean how they managed to deliver it all is it's just amazing but they did but um yeah they've obviously had a good pandemic but there's others you know recruitment consultants where you know one client has basically said if you look at their monthly turnover and you put on the same sort of graph the um the dates when the lockdown the three lockdowns have happened yeah. they kind of match perfectly you know their turnover yeah. crashes because no one's um prepared to take a start on they can't invoice yeah. you know and that, that's the way it is so yeah it's uh, you know fortunately i don't have many clients that are in retail <laughs> well Yes, <laughs> can I? I mean, th th that's just horrendous. If you were selling the wrong sort of goods, then yeah, yeah, it's a yeah. nightmare. Yes, and it was, uh, I mean, I was talking to some friends yesterday and just talking about things opening back up to whatever extent they do open back up, and uh, and even then, you know, it's still there'll still be stuff to work itself out because there'll be companies that have kind of hung on by their fingertips and you know waiting to open, and then they do open, and it just doesn't work out for them. And like you say, you know, the opposite side of that as well, where people were, you know, on the verge of bankruptcy and then they do open and then they're fine. So mm. you're going to get a lot of. We have to wait to see how that, all of that will shake out if and when yeah. it happens. So how was the adjustment to working from home? Was that I, I mean, initially, it must have just been a nightmare for you because you're getting all this extra work, extra inquiries, people coming in. W were you initially sort of. Was there no separation between work and life? Was it literally fall out of bed, start answering the phone, and be there till like nine o'clock, ten o'clock at night? Or did you manage to keep some discipline in there? It was probably easier last March because it was the end of March and spring was on its way and the evenings were getting lighter. And we had some fantastic weather, didn't we? In yeah, yeah. April and May and possibly even June. So I do kind of like to try and cycle, not quite as... Uh, you don't get out of my bike as much as some people I know but uh, so you know when Boris says you could go out for an hour's exercise I was trying to do that on on my bike but now it's cold and dark yeah. and, miserable, and it's snowy <laughs> and this has gone on for nearly 12 months now and there's no yeah. end and you know I can go days I can you know sometimes I can go like if I haven't been to the office during the week I can I can go for you know the whole of the working day week my wife will say you haven't been out of the house Simon you know and it's just <laughs> well it's nothing you know in the evening when it's dark and cold and nothing's open why would you yeah. want to leave yeah well uh, I again talking to other people and say you know there's only so many walks you can go <laughs> <laughs> and even then you know like when you used to go for walks you know there'd normally be a pub in there somewhere <laughs> So it's yeah. like you, you do your circuit of whatever walk you've met someone and you keep in your distance you do your walk and then you get to the end and you're like well that's it now we have to go home and say like, <laughs> what i want to do is sit down and have a drink and a natter but you know we can't do that no not at all oh uh, yeah um, so yeah trying to get the balance right is difficult and one of my staff who has children at primary school she would turn up to work after she dropped them off so she'd start at half nine and she'd have to leave at half two in order to go and pick them up mm. well since she's worked at home she her hours have increased massively she might not start now till a bit later but she's prepared you know 
I'm not forcing her to do it, but she's kind of eager to do more and more things. And the number of hours she's worked is just massively increased, which she does get paid for. And, it, you know, she's not wait. Yeah, she says she feels a bit guilty at times about it, but she's doing useful stuff. And I, you know, she might send me a message. It's, I don't know, in the evening, and I'm saying, well, yeah, this is the answer. But you don't have to do it till tomorrow. <laughs> Can wait till tomorrow. <laughs> you know, it's late. <laughs> so, I mean, her her way of working is completely different, and I can't imagine her ever coming back to the office permanently. You know, maybe yeah. once a week type thing. But uh, yeah, yeah. I think we've, especially with her family situation, we've proved it can work. Um, at home yeah uh, so yeah I mean the legit there's the logistics because whilst I do have a lot of things online I do have um, sort of paper files that, mm. for, for some things and trying to get those around s- staff or we also if I get a, we get letters in they get scanned put in our online system and then we shred the bit of paper so mm. trying to get those so one person's got the scanner and a printer at their home and a, a shredding <laughs> bag. And, you know, I'll drop stuff off with her or occasionally she'll come and pick things up from my house. And then I'll say to her, How, you know, how's the shredding bag? She'll say, oh, it's full. I need another one. So you then have to sort of, it's all of that logistics of mm. get it, you know, whilst we can do as much online as we possibly can, there's still, there are some physical things that, yeah. that need doing and, um, it's all right if I'm driving into the office to, you know, divert off and go past somebody's house. But if it, if I wasn't planning to go in the office that day, I really can't, you know, to get the motivation to drive off to someone's mm. house. To, yeah, in working hours, because I don't want to be a horrible boss and turning up at seven o'clock in the evening and dragging yeah. the extenders or whatever happens to be on <laughs> and uh, saying, oh, here you are. You know, oh, you don't have to do it till the following day, but, you know, <laughs> you've got to answer the door to me. <laughs> you know, so I've avoided doing that anyway. <laughs> So one of the other things about having a, you know, a physical workspace to be working in is, you know, I, I don't, and I've discussed this on other podcasts, mm-hmm. like, one of the main things that we all talk about when we're talking about a workplace is like, you know, the people and the people counting. Now, I've heard different sort of sides of this. So I've heard people definitely say, oh, like, you know, we have more collegiate interaction now. Like, you know, you can kind of, because you've got the chat open, you can chat with people people all through the day and stuff but then you also don't get the the random conversations and interactions and also when you just like you've been looking at a document or whatever for hours and you're just like I need to get away from this for a bit and just be able to chat to someone where you're making the brew or something yeah how how has that side been in like in terms of have you been have you all kind of kept in touch quite well and you know there's still some conversation or has it been a lot of working alone and lots of responding to messages that's a good question um i've tried not to force things so i know some firms you know nine o'clock every day they'll all have a you know a team zoom meeting and Mm. and they could all meet up and talk i mean i suppose it depends what industry and what you know they're in and what they're doing i've kind of avoided having something as artificial as that probably because I would have to take the lead on it and you know it's it's, it's hard chairing zoom meetings isn't it so, as we know from the yeah. internet yes <laughs> but yes with this new phone system we've got we do have a bit of a chat and so there is um as well as me being able to send messages to individuals you know we there is a group for everybody and when it got set up one person did send a message saying is this the place we can put down about what Sunday evening TV we watch and I instantly put yeah of course like, what are you watching you know just so it's it yes it in one thing you know it takes people away from doing the job they're supposed to be doing but it kind of it builds a team it builds you know some sort of rapport with people you know so um, a business one of those sort of sent out to all their contacts like a, a Christmas quiz and so I sort of shared that and one individual and their partner one evening answered practically all the questions <laughs> and it kind of amazed us all and uh, you know I thought we'd perhaps all answer a few little ones you know each but this one person managed to answer just about every single question I think the rest of us just thought well that's it we'll give up <laughs> but, you know, but at least it gave them and their partner something to do one evening yeah, you know, so 
you know, fantastic. But yes, trying to maintain that rapport, it, it is difficult. I mean, since the pandemic first happened last March, I have recruited somebody and he's physically never met anybody else apart from me. Yeah, yeah. And it does seem a bit strange. Yeah. Um, but that's kind of life, isn't it? And, well, it is uh, very strange. It's like having, you know, our man in Havana or something. <laughs> <laughs> like, the, the person that does that thing that none of us have met that turns over there. <laughs> and he struggles with the, uh, with the others in the firm because he can't remember, because a lot of them have got names that begin with J's and G's and it's all yeah. easy to get confused by. Um, it's not a policy of my behalf, it's just the way things have <laughs> turned out. So he got, he because he, he's never met them yeah. and he's, he's only like a name on an email yeah. or a name on a, a message. Yeah. He'll frequently say to me, oh, so-and-so, are they the one who's done that? I'll say, no, it's not them, it's this person. <laughs> but I totally get why he's doing that. And it's not, he's, he's, it's not there's anything wrong with him. It's just, he's never met them. He's, but you've got no reference really, have you? Yeah. Like, unless you've met the actual person, you know, it's just another name and another photo on the internet of the many millions and billions of names and photos. It's just like that person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you need, you, need, you need the presence. You need the person there sometimes. Well, yeah, I, mean, I know some people, some firms at Christmas had a virtual Christmas party. I mean, my one of my brothers, his biz, the firm he worked for, they were, they all got sent. I think it was like um, something like a cocktail making kit, and they had to make cocktails. Well, I don't quite know how it went, but beforehand, he did sort of message me and my other brother saying, "Oh, laptops, alcohol, cocktail making. What could go wrong?" <laughs> <laughs> we have no more work computers now <laughs> but we all had a good time until our screen went blank <laughs> oh dear <laughs> yeah. we live in strange times <laughs> yeah it, that, that sounds like one of those things that's like oh that's a great idea and everyone gets excited about and then no one's thought about the obvi obvious practical <laughs> reality of it so staying on tech and software and stuff, um, and I noticed again on the website that you said, you know, you, you like to encourage people to move on to sort of accounting software mm -hmm. and so on. And you, you said before when you were doing your accountancy exams, that was sort of pre-internet boom times. So you've seen pretty much this whole process mm -hmm. of you know, bookkeeping, keeping packages and various accounting software and so on. I would imagine at this point it's pretty good, like yes. very effective and really good at sorting things and doing all sorts of things and automating things for you. Yeah. Has that always been the case? Have they always just been very, very useful or has it kind of reached a point where it's now super useful? What's the trajectory of that kind of software? Sure. Oh, that's a good question. Sorry, it's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can just like, you know, the last three years or just talk about the benefits of the software and what that can do now, if you prefer. Well, no, it's, well, it's I mean, the whole thing has completely progressed. So smaller firms back in the day probably didn't have any proper accounting records at all and just relied on the bank balance. Mm. So uh, I remember when I was training and i went out to a client to do you know prepare their accounts and they were like a, a wood merchants and they were telling me about my colleague who'd been the previous year and they said oh you know he, he complained that we hadn't you know the bank didn't balance and you know we hadn't recorded things properly and you know he spent how many days you know or possibly all week getting it right and at the end of the week you know the director turned around to my colleague and said well what bank balance have you got and so my colleague told him and so the director just got his checkbook out in those days turned to the checkbook stub and he'd kept a running total and his figure was practically the same mm -hmm. so but that was the way he monitored his accounts he just kept mm -hmm. a, a manual running total on his checkbook on the checkbook stubs and that you know that that was all he cared about so since i remember uh, again training one one of my colleagues said he went out to try and pay someone. And the first job he had to do was <laughs> open the envelopes to take the bank statements out of them <laughs> before he could even summarise them. I mean, so how that guy had any idea what was happening in the business, I don't know. <laughs> uh, 
so, so fortunately, I think generally a lot of businesses, especially the ones I come across, are a lot better. That when I first set Garth up, there was one client, he didn't stay with me very long, fortunately, who handed me a, a plastic bag full of receipts and said, there you go. Actually, sorry, it's probably a shoebox. <laughs> and a third of the receipts were his personal ones, which had nothing to do with the business. Yeah. Um, a third of them related to the next tax year, and I wasn't interested in. <laughs> and a third related to the year I was, I, I was I was interested. But you have to go through every single receipt, yeah. open it, look at the date, look at what it's for, and think about it. Mm. So when you get when he gets a large bill, that's his fault for not having paid any care and attention. I mean, in the box, I also found a five pound note and uh, more embarrassingly, well, for him, um, business cards from um, an escort agency. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, there might have been a few of them. So I I put them in the bin because I didn't want to be (laughs) my wife (laughs) finding those lying around thinking it was me. (laughs) <laughs> anyway. so since then yeah people started to use spreadsheets but the trouble with spreadsheets is especially for um people who just who perhaps haven't had any training the formulas can be wrong so i've had clients s- s- send me a spreadsheet to us to do our year in accounts and then they've said oh in the accounts you prepared you've got against i don't know insurance this figure of a thousand pounds but in my spreadsheet i sent you it's got 900 pounds i'm thinking oh, why is it different why is it different and I've looked at their spreadsheet and realised that their formula had missed out the last five rows mm. with the hundred extra hundred pound insurance. So to, I just have to email them back. So the difference is because you were using your spreadsheets, and obviously I didn't put that. You know, <laughs> your formula was wrong, and I corrected your formula, and you know that that's yeah. that's the right figure. And uh, yeah, that's fine. They were happy with that. So ha- having things in the proper accounts package, it should save time because instead of and there should be less mistakes. So if you're sending out an invoice to a customer on an accounts package, you type in the information, you check it's right, you approve it, and you click send and boom, emails off. If you're doing that in a Word document or a spreadsheet, if you're copying last times, you've probably forgotten to change the date or yeah. you've probably forgotten to change the invoice number. Yeah. Or even if you get everything, and these are mistakes I make, I mean, I'm not having a go at anybody else. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I'm thinking the same as well of like, yep, I've definitely done that in jobs. <laughs> <laughs> and then even if you get it all right, you know, you then have to convert it to a PDF, which you know, then email it out or post it or whatever. But then you have to record it somewhere, you know has that invoice been paid yet? How do you know it's been paid? You know, if you then put it into a spreadsheet, you might type the figures incorrectly. Mm-hmm. This, but if it's all on an accounts package and you've done the invoice right because it's a new invoice, yes, the date might be today's date and not the end of the previous month or whatever. But assuming the invoice is correct and you press approve and then said the accounts package and says right you owe this amount of that you've got this number of sales and somebody owes you this amount of money and then especially these online ones i mean so i prefer my favorite one is um, one called zero which is spelled x e r o they all have, can't spell yeah. gaps don't ask me <laughs> why um so you can connect your bank um statements to um, the accounts package so every day or sometimes two or three times a day transactions that have hit your company your business bank account appear in your accounts package mm. and you can say oh yeah that invoice i sent out this morning for 500 quid you know um, joanna's now paid it there's 500 quid that's i can see has come in fine i can just click boom and it, you know, suddenly that that bank transaction is in on the bank. The bank's reconciled, and that sales invoice is treated as paid just yeah. by clicking OK. I mean, it's just that is compared to what I've seen in the past. That is just so phenomenally brilliant. Mm-hmm. But what I find that a lot of these accounts packages, they kind of it's like Microsoft. They want to take over the world. They want to keep growing. They don't mm-hmm. just want to have the best bookkeeping system. They want yeah. to attach an accounts package. That, to it so the accountant can then get their accounts package and and from the bookkeeping can then produce a set of accounts and a tax return mm. and you know can do all sorts of other things but then you might be if you're an accountant you need to record the time you're spent on clients so let's have a time recording system that feeds into and so suddenly they instead of just having yeah. this fantastic simple brilliant 
at all. The system. Yeah. They want to have this all singing, all dancing. And then you, whilst I think Zero is still the best, there are things I think it can improve. And it just frustrates me that what I think must be a simple tweak, they're not doing, but instead they're sort of trying to build all these other great things that you know you might have heard of a, a company called receipt bank where they'll you know you, they'll do a scan of a receipt or an invoice and if you've set it up properly it should try and convert that to a um, an invoice within your accounts package right. uh, over time they're improving so you know the, tr- the accounts package companies try and set up their own versions and when i try them out it just takes longer than doing it just typing the figure in yeah. <laughs> yourself um because you scan something in and then it takes ages or they minim- you know they don't give you all the detail you want and yeah so things like that i think they could just so the, the, going back to your original question Simon, is where do i see the movement of travel i see the movement of travel that these companies want to try and have an all singing all dancing one stop package for the accountants and the client mm-hmm. but that then becomes a bit like um, microsoft where you can't get rid of bing for love of money yeah. and you know, you have all these things that you don't want, that you don't yeah. know how they work. That you'll never use. <laughs> yeah. So like, especially with Microsoft, I mean, I've been, um, I remember going to a talk once and somebody saying, you know, showing a few things at Microsoft saying, you've probably got this on your computer and you probably don't even know about it. And I went back yeah. and yeah, you know, things that you just, you don't know. You, yeah, and I was probably prepared to pay money from a third party company to provide exactly the same service, but you just didn't know it was hidden there. And mm. I think that's where they kind of, they want to be, yeah, one-stop shop for everything. And I, I think they should just specialise in what they do best. So well, yeah, I mean, that's counter to specialisation in the first place, really. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a reason for specialisation. Okay, they're, like we're doing more interdisciplinary stuff and crossing across some of these boundaries more. But there are certain things that need to be done and done in a specific way and done in a dedicated way and it's useful to have people that really know the ins and outs of those things and yeah. i think that's going to stay you know you will always need a level of that i think yeah and also they kind of grow by acquiring and then yeah. they've got the headache of getting two different it systems to talk to each other mm-hmm. and that frequently doesn't work and then or they might buy a company that supposedly produces accounts but it's a company that no one's ever heard of so they probably mm. bought it cheap because no one's ever heard of them because no one's using them. But everybody's mm. using the more expensive specialist one that does a job when everybody knows does the job. And it's, no one's ever going to leave because it does the job. And you, can't, you know, if, I, if, if you go to an accountant for a set of accounts, I can't afford to get them wrong or have a system that doesn't produce what I want it to produce. Yeah, yeah. And with big firms, in my experience with sort of purchasing kind of softwares and you've got to, you know, you, you're putting these codes in, for, for various things and various budgets and teams and so on but getting the system in and getting it operating and getting the staff you know especially in a large organization where you need you need to organize all the licenses you need to make sure that everyone's trained up and it always seems to be the case that there's like one person in the organization that actually clicked with it is like oh no i get it i understand this and they have to answer all the questions for everyone because everyone's like <laughs> I, I I know how to do this. I've got the manual. This this is working, but that's not working. So this, whoever understands it's getting all the, the queries. <laughs> <laughs> that seems that's my experience of those sort of things. Well, yeah, because none of us ever actually do read the manual, <laughs> do we? <laughs> only only for the 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 task that you're doing at the moment. How do I do that again? <laughs> oh, I can do that as well. Gosh, I didn't know that. <laughs> Oh, you mean that thing that I've been spending hours of my life doing? I could have just pressed the button. Oh, <laughs> I should have read those instructions. <laughs> In terms of future proofing, like, I mean, do you think, are they, are they going to make you technologically unemployed? Is the software going to put you out of business or is it more just freeing up time to actually spend more time with more clients and, you know, do the work better? Oh, this all, I mean, there's been articles on that, conversations about that, you know, over the last 10, 20 years. Is that AI, that's the next one. Is that going to get rid of the need for a lot of the work that we do? There would always, I mean, people buy from people, don't they? You, you always need yeah. some sort of human interaction. The tax rules are just absolutely so complicated and so ridiculously complicated that whilst uh, I do need a computer to help me on you know interpret them you still need a human being to look at it and think actually does that make sense or yeah 
why does that make sense? And can I ex- be able to explain that to my client that, you know, this is the result that's being produced? And, and can uh, I explain it in different ways, in ways that they'll understand? Whereas, you know, a computer is going to work on a flowchart of just like, it will spit out whatever's pre-written explanation. It can't, if you don't understand that, there's no way for you to recontextualize it. It's not going to rephrase it for you. And sometimes the things that are quite technical, quite difficult. So like yesterday, I said to a client, look, I've got to explain this to you. When I've finished explaining, if you don't understand it, just say to me, Simon, you haven't explained that well enough. And I will think hard and I will try to explain it to you in another way. And he had to say it to me twice that he didn't understand. And I thought I was using as simple language as possible because I hate any professional hiding behind professional long words just to try and confuse yeah. people as an example of that I remember our eldest when he was at you know at reception he had this lovely teacher at the end of the year he had a lovely handwritten sort of report read it understood it next year he had the same teacher because she'd gone up with the class but they'd moved on to some sort of computerized report system which obviously had drop down boxes with educational jargon and I remember reading it thinking I know what all the words mean, but I don't know what this report means. I don't know if it's a good report. I don't know if it's a bad report. You know, <laughs> I have no idea because the teacher was being given words and was just, oh, yeah, that, 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 yeah, that phrase all fits in nicely as opposed to sitting down and thinking about it. So as a professional, it's part of our job to, you know, whether it's a, a teacher, you know, a vicar giving a sermon, whatever, you know, accountant, lawyer, I think we're here to try and talk to the lay person and get them to understand as much as they possibly can i mean some things are so technical it'd be difficult if obviously but yeah. to understand in in language that they can comprehend what on earth's going on and uh, yeah. if i fail if i can't do that then i do get really annoyed with myself because it's just i just see that so fundamental it's um, yeah but uh, do you subscribe to that idea of if you can't explain it easily you don't understand it yourself Do, is that feeling is it kind of like I, I, I can't explain this to this person I maybe I've not got the handle the right handle on it I think sometimes that's true sometimes maybe the person at the other end of the phone call might just not want to understand it or might not be clever enough to understand anything yeah but uh, yeah definitely I do agree some you know it, it's a proverb or something isn't it that you know um if you've you you can only truly tell that you understand it if you can explain it to somebody and I, I, yeah i generally subscribe to that but yeah it's i don't think it's a fixed and fast rule yeah so coming up to other future things uh, well and, and present things so i want to touch on brexit briefly and i would I imagine you'd probably have more to say on this than anyone else but you may not you know as much as anyone else (laughs) but I I would imagine you've had to do a fair bit of reading on this subject and you are aware of some of the potential changes so I'm aware of some of the potential changes because I mainly deal with UK taxes where I most get involved would be if it is, is potentially with VAT because that came out of the European Union or the common market or whatever it was called at the time. So all the European Union countries, the VAT rules, whilst there's variations in each country, the foundation, the concept of it all is the same. Mm-hmm. And they were very, they got more complicated, the rules, if you traded between European Union countries. Mm-hmm. And now, yes, I'm not, you know, I'm not entirely sure I'd have to sort of, well, before I used to have to remind myself every time about if you sold goods or services, if you sold it to a person or a business, and if the birth business was able to quote you their VAT number, you know, some of these, you know, so if you sold it, some goods to a business and in, in Europe, when we were part of the European Union, they could give you their VAT number, then you didn't need to add VAT to it, but you needed to put them on a quarterly report of your sales to European Union countries right, yeah, and, you. you know, so some of that will have changed um, i just need to get my you know refresh myself on that type of thing mm-hmm. it's really funny every client who's ever spoken to me about brexit regardless of what their view is assumes i voted the same way as them <laughs> and i have heard every view well i've heard that both sides and a, a guy who said that he really couldn't make up his mind and didn't vote 
<laughs> so, yeah. You know, I've heard it all. I can't possibly have voted the way that everybody's spoken to me about it. Um, <laughs> it was the Unless one... you voted a few times. <laughs> <laughs> it was the one occasion when a client actually phoned me up and said, how should I vote? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so I didn't think I could possibly tell them how to vote. So I kind of just asked them some questions and tried to tease it out of them, you know, yeah. what they, they actually they leaning, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't for me to tell somebody how to vote. I think that would be that's a bit of an abuse of power, isn't it? Mm. And uh, yeah. but you literally no one's ever done that at any general election or anything. And the day after when the results were announced, I had at least two clients phone up in complete panic mode one has since sold his business and is very glad that he he did mm. i don't know if brexit was the driver for him to do that mm. it might well have been but he's really glad especially with the pandemic that he got out before all of that so yeah. uh, whether how much it's going to have an economic impact i have no idea i think there's some businesses that will be hit. i mean you hear these horror stories on the news don't you have um you know freight forward is just saying the business has just dropped completely and mm-hmm. the government say oh no it hasn't and uh, stuff like that well yeah you can find anything to uh, you know whatever you want to believe you can find <laughs> someone to support yeah. it online <laughs> no totally um yeah and it depends on whether somebody's business is is focused entirely within the uk but even then they're going to have some implications because of it yeah i mean there'll be other regs that come down the line and like you know as they go through things they will i mean you know it's not like they're going to leave the tax laws and (laughs) things alone is it (laughs) oh gosh no and we always tend to gold plate everything so my you know depression i've always had is if something comes out of you we always make it slightly tighter and tougher and whatever else. I mean, again, whether I'm just reading the wrong things on the internet, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't claim to be an expert <laughs> in that. But um, I mean, that does seem to be one of the complaints at the moment with the people in Northern Ireland saying it's, uh, it's easier to get goods out of Northern Ireland to the rest of Britain than it is to get goods into Northern Ireland from Scotland, Wales and England. But uh, I, I don't claim to have any expertise on on that but uh i could be quite easily believe it um yeah so uh, at the moment then you've not i mean was it quite busy at the time when the vote happened then I, again you were you just getting inundated with sort of what does this mean to me um not really i mean part of that one client that phoned me up to ask how I vote, you know I mean, people would perhaps pass it as you know a, a comment where you're doing a big a meeting or a phone call but mm. I don't really remember anything beforehand after, but about. I mean, afterwards, you know, different clients have, you know, obviously spoken to me about it, and they've all kind of voted for different reasons. You mm. know, it's I, a lot of it was based on who the ones have spoken to, but just based on their experience and whether they've seen what's come out of Europe as um, a good influence on their industry, on their lives, or or not. Mm-hmm. That I think is reflected how they voted. Yeah, I mean, at the moment, I think it's too early to see how well how it's going to economically impact us, and also what we're going to move away from. I mean, as a tax, I don't particularly like VAT. It's a bit of a blunt instrument and relies on businesses to do too much to collect it, and they get told off if they get it wrong. And especially when you then have the online retailers who, you know, if they send their goods from outside of the UK don't yeah. need to necessarily put it on and it you know it's an unfair advantage especially for our poor retailers who are having to pay business you know rates and have been shut yeah. you know it's just yeah if if they can do something to sort of make it simple which the government ages ago set up this department called the office of tax simplification don't ask me what they've done because i can can't tell you I, I think they've got rid of some rules and regulations that no one ever, you know, it didn't really matter because no one followed them. Cause it was, no one noticed. <laughs> no one noticed. But uh, all governments, and it's not just this current government, all, all yeah, that they find that there's somebody finds a hole in their tax legislation, and so they then make it more and more complicated, and it just becomes a complete nightmare mm. in order to fix the hole of somebody abusing it, uh, and it just, yeah, it's. Uh, so if I could have a more a simple VAT system 
whether that's some, I mean, before we, we joined the common market, I, I think there used to be some sales tax or, you know, something that's just simple and easy to understand and administer, then I'd be all for it, you know, it's, yes. <laughs> okay, so here's one to throw at you. Do you think, though, that that over uh, over complexity is part and parcel of the idea of professionalization in that, you know, to a degree, when you are a, a professional, it is about, what's the word I'm looking for, like contain knowledge and like keep keeping knowledge, you know, being a keeper of knowledge, and there being a level of power associated to that in that, you know, I know the thing, you have to consult me for the thing, and that gives me power. Do you think some of it is just there because, <laughs> to justify the, the professionalization it's like it's really really complex and you have to study it for a long time because that's the way it has to be or is that completely unfair that might be true for some things i don't think that's necessarily true for tax but could tax be simple i mean could it be uh, it, it, well, it, yes it could be a lot simpler that, but they have um tax becomes more complicated because, well, for a number of reasons, and I won't be able to list all the reasons. <laughs> so you should have given me a month's <laughs> notice. I could have written an essay on it. Uh, um, but tax becomes more complicated because they want to stop loopholes. Mm. Um, so, as I said earlier, somebody could, uh, I'm desperately trying to think of an example at the moment, but some bright spark thinks about something and can see. Um, if he, if he structured events you know and, and systems in a particular way you might get outside a particular tax so then the legislators come back with a counter argument and they make the tax a bit more the rules more complicated saying right well in this case this would apply and in that case it doesn't and then suddenly you've got you know instead of having you know really simple rules it's a little bit more complicated and then this bright spark will think of another way of trying to avoid paying tax by setting up their scheme in one particular another way and, and so the tax scheme, legislators then respond and create even more rules to to stop that and that becomes more and more complicated but they then have rules to do with policy yeah you know, setting a pol policy agenda so um a silly example car benefits so the employee gets taxed differently if the company car they have is an electric car, a petrol car, or a diesel car. Right. Yeah. The electric car last tax year, they got taxed at 16%. This year it's 0%. Next year it'll be 1%. And the year after that, 2%. So they, they, they want people to get electric cars. Yeah. You know, and if that means because they're so expensive, it has to be a company car because the companies can afford it, fine. You know, it, it becomes. You know, traditionally, I've said to clients, you don't want to have a company car, it's going to cost you too much in tax. And that's been the party line for goodness knows how many years. So this tax year, I've had to change that and say, if you want a company car and it's 100% electric, great, let's talk about it. If you want anything else, don't touch it with a barge pole, own it personally. But that's because they've, they've got a policy they want to introduce. And, and we'd all agree we should be all moving to electric cars. Mm. It'd be great if they could be affordable. But, you know, as a policy decision making ability, you know, that's we all agree with it. it. It is why we have loads of tax and duty on cigarettes. We want people not to smoke. We try and price it out of, you know, their ability to smoke as much or, or, or at all or whatever. So there's things like that, which we don't necessarily, you know, we support the idea, but when they bring it into the tax system, it just creates a level of being of complex complexity. So like national insurance, people still think national insurance is paying into some little pension pot with their name on it. You know, sorry, 11 Downing Street, there's not a little pot that says si you know, Simon and this is your, your, your state pension. It's just a tax by any other name. It might have started off with an idea, you know, back in the 19 whatevers when the Liberal Party introduced it and then Labour later on extended it. You know, it might have started off as a, a, a great way to make sure that the hard labouring workers had something at the end, but it's just a tax. And when in, they retire, it's just an item of expenditure for the government. There's no pension pot like you might do privately. It's mm. just so. I would get. I would just abolish national insurance. It would make my life as an accountant a lot easier. Now I might lose some clients because some of my way of structuring things relies on the fact of the national insurance difference. But 
if it wasn't national insurance and income tax had to be slightly higher, they'd still get the same amount of money. But, you know, I wouldn't have to talk to clients about, well, if you're self-employed, you've got to pay class two and class four national insurance. If you're mm. an employee, you'll be paying class one. And then well, there's class three national insurance, which is voluntary. So if you don't think you've paid enough national insurance, you could subscribe to class three. Well, mm. it's just a tax. It's just a tax, but it, there's, there's certain things that it does. And so like when we were in the global financial crisis and, you know, George Osborne said, we're all in it together, they entered a whole load of rules that just made it more complicated because they wanted, you know, the coalition government or whoever it was, wanted it to be seen that, you know, we're all in it together. So um, oh, the middle class is, you know, they can pay more tax. So we'll, we'll you yeah, know, ever since it been introduced in the 1940s, child benefit had just been given to um, everyone, every mother. Yeah. Um, I think initially when it was on the second child, but it then went to every child, you know, and there were different rates for, you know, first child, mm. one rate. But if the, the mother got it, regardless of how much money or or whatever, and it was simple, you know, mm. have a baby, fill the form in, mm. you get the money. And then to suddenly turn around and say, right, if one of the partners earns more than £50,000, we're going to start to claw it back. And by the time that that partner is earning £60,000, we'd have claimed it all back. So you give it to the mother. And if the father's in a well-paid job, the father would pay it back. But if the mother was in a well-paid job, she'd pay it back. But you could have one household where husband and wife, for want of a better phrase, are each earning £49,999. So the family unit's got £100,000 more or less coming in. And mm -hmm. next door, you've got a single mum who's earning £70,000. Well, the single mum on £70,000 has to pay back all the child benefit, but the couple next door on a just short of £100,000 keep the child benefit. Mm. You know, and it it is a rule that's not publicised well enough. Um, so I did a tax return for someone this year, and he basically said he didn't know anything about it, and the whole reason he had to do a tax return was because he had child benefit, well, his wife mm. had child benefit. And... What they don't tell anybody yet is if a, mo a mother, and it's usually the mother, so, you know, if, if the mother's in receipt of child benefit, if she doesn't work or she doesn't earn enough to get a national insurance record every year towards mm. her state pension, if she's in receipt of national insurance, she gets that national insurance, you know, receipt of child benefit, sorry. If she's in receipt of child benefit, she gets a national insurance record. So, mm. so there might be some circumstances where it's better for the mother to receive the national insurance and the father to pay it back mm. because the mother gets the national insurance record, but they just have to make sure they don't spend the money and she has to give it to him and he has to pay it over on his tax, which does create a few problems, obviously. <laughs> but they didn't say that. So the, the, the couple might think, oh, I can't be bothered for her to get the money and for him to pay it over. Let's just stop it mm. but then when she gets to whatever the state retirement age at, you know when the mother has to retire she hasn't got sufficient records national insurance record to get a state pension but if mm. she'd had a uh, child benefit she would have done so but they've created this problem for the future and this problem now because we're all in it together mm. and there's other tax things where you know for um People who own properties, residential properties, and rent them out, they don't necessarily get the full uh, full interest deduction against their profits. Well, you could turn around and say, "Yeah, fabulously wealthy person, that's fine." But I've got clients where you know somebody might have had their own house, but they've moved in with someone else and they've rented their house out. Yeah. You know, not sure what's going to happen with the relationship yeah. or, or whatever reason. Yeah. You know, they might have gone overseas for a bit and expect to come back. And suddenly they get they're in really weird tax positions, especially if they've got student loans. And it's just it's things like that where they've they've had a policy. You know, we want to see the middle classes pay more tax. Mm. Let's let's do this. Well, the implications of doing that just creates problems. So that's why I think just kind of simplify everything. But you know, yes, you do have to be aware of people trying to abuse the system, and 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 you know. If we want to live in this country, if we want to have a national health service, if we want to have decent roads, et cetera, et cetera, we're going to have to pay tax. Mm. And people have got to understand that. And most decent people do and they're prepared to pay a, a reasonable amount of tax. Um, but yes, 
we've got to watch out for those people who, you know, if somebody is very wealthy, they can afford to pay lawyers and accountants. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. To, to come up with bizarre ideas to get around it all. And then if somebody has a policy objective, which we agree with, it's, it's how can that be used in the tax system to encourage us to do something or not do something, but without making it bizarrely complicated? Well, yeah, the other side of that as well is, you know, you, your inclination to comply. Like if you have all these contradicting regulations, rules and regulations, that as far as you can see, come from nowhere, make no sense. And it just like what most of the time you just like, well, non-compliance, non-interest. <laughs> like, I just want to ignore that and, and not deal with it whatsoever, because who wants to spend, you know, hours and hours figuring out something to give, you know, to uh, basically something that you're going to lose money on of like, I'm going to have to pay out for this thing and I need to find out loads of information about it. It's um, it's counterproductive. It's like if you want more buy-in, then people like generally, like my experience of when they talk about workplace change or buy-in for, for things, mm. it's a matter of convincing people of the benefit to them. And like you say, you know, most of us can understand the benefit of giving tax we're all making a contribution and so on but in terms of what they're doing with it on and how it's how it's collected and what's going on with it most of the time it's just like well what it what is that i mean i like so i've i've registered this as a company i'm gonna have to do uh some tax returns and stuff you know for the first year that'll be my first time doing that and doing it mm -hmm. for myself which to me is kind of the the most off-putting thing of of being you know a business yeah. when you the plus side of being in a job is they take care of all that for you you just you know you go in you get paid yeah i mean somebody who's an employee unless there's a mistake made you know they haven't record you know the, the employer hasn't recorded a benefit in kind and eventually tells hmrc and somebody catches up but usually most for most employees the tax they pay is correct it gets deducted at the end of the month national insurance gets deducted the money that goes into their bank account is their money. They can do what they want with it. And no one's going to come and ask them for more tax or give them a tax refund. It's just usually it's right. That said, I could give you examples of where that hasn't been the case. And the main one is most people don't understand their tax code. So they don't look on, their, on every pay slip. It's got your tax code. And if it's not the standard at this year, it's 1250L. You, want, you need to know why, because HMRC can be very sticky. So five years ago, your employer gave you national, you know, gave you medical insurance. You had to pay that as a benefit in kind. You then left the, that company and went somewhere else. HMRC right. knows you went somewhere else. But yeah. five years ago, they got told you had medical insurance as a benefit in kind. So it's on their system. And so they think every year you've got medical insurance as a benefit in kind. Mm -hmm. And so every year you're paying slightly too much tax. But the opposite could happen. You know, there are things you can claim for, like professional fees that you have to pay in order to do your job. Well, you might mm -hmm. have not be in that organisation anymore. You might not be paying it or your employer might be paying for it for you now. But they're still giving you the benefit, the tax relief. Mm -hmm. So I um, think <laughs> because one client who... Um, had his own company, but previously worked somewhere. And his tax code had rolled forward for however many years, something like £7,000 of business expenses. Mm. So for, generally it didn't matter. 600000 did you say? No, no, 6000 6000 That's still a phenomenal <laughs> sum of money. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, professional fees are normally a hundred, couple of hundred quid, if that. I mean, this I'd ne I've never seen one that large, but they'd kept rolling, HMRC had kept rolling it forward. No, Nobody at their end, probably because it's all computer generated, yeah. had thought, uh, oh, we've had this for X number of years. It's a huge figure. Should yeah. we check it's still valid especially yeah. when he was submitting tax returns it wasn't even referred to on his tax return so this bit that hmrc which had got the tax return wasn't talking to another bit of hmrc that reduces the tax code you know it's um anyway that, that, that's a, a vein a rich vein we could go in the differences within different <laughs> sections of hmrc but um so yeah so generally as an employee your tax should be fine but please will anybody listening to this 
check your pay slip and check your tax code. And if it looks strange, contact HMRC and ask them about it, because that's where I've seen the biggest problems with ordinary employees. But, you know, yeah, if you're in business, you know, I have a bit of a, a lecture, well, conversation I have with, with people thinking of setting up in business. And one of the biggest things is, you know, you've got to pay tax at some point in the future. Your company in a normal year will pay tax nine months and one day after its year end. Well, when you're used to being in a job and all the tax, all the national insurance, you know, at the end of February, it's just deducted. It's just a line on your pay slip and the balance has gone into your bank account and you can spend it on whatever you want mm. to have that. You know, well, the company's got nine months in a day after the year end, but the year's 12 months. So, you know, if you if, if you're a seasonal business, and your first month is when you make all your profits, you've got a long time to not spend your tax money. Yeah. And then as an individual, if you if you're whether you're self-employed or you're mainly taking dividends, you've got to do a tax return that's after the tax year has got to be filed by January. So the tax year finishes 5th of April, tax return has to be filed by the 31st of January, and the tax has to be paid by 31st of January. Well, again, you've got a long time to, you know, be bothered to do your tax return or be bothered to give the information to your accountant to do your tax return and then find the money. And I used to have colleagues who worked in, who did nothing but tax, you know, not in my current company, but in previous companies I've worked for who just had no idea of how the real world worked. And they just thought that, you know, obviously they, they spend all day doing nothing but tax. Yeah. And they thought it, if on the 31st of January, they gave a client a tax return that says, oh, you owe £10,000, that that client would have known that. And that client would have just had the £10,000 just waiting to pay yeah, over. Yeah, yeah. Well, guess what? <laughs> Welcome to yeah. the middle. <laughs> some some clients obviously would have that some clients are very organized and you know very good but there's other people if there's a pound left in the bank account they're going to spend it but again surely it would be a case of the people who the people who get caught by things like that are the people you know that's an unexpected thing it's the people who don't know whereas you you well resourced well financed well versed people will be like i need to be on that because i don't want to get caught by that well sh- they should have done or for whatever reason they had that money I, you know i can't remember the example you know the reason for that particular one i mean it wasn't ten thousand, but whatever but yes if, if they'd sold something or if they were making loads of money it, it should have been explained to them or they should have sought out and asked the question you know what are the tax implications of doing this or not doing this and whilst we might you know might not know the exact figure because we don't know the, all the information at the point of the question you know, just for me telling clients, well, your company's going to have to pay 19% of its profit. So every time you get some a receipt in from a customer, you've got to set aside a bit for the VAT and you've got to set aside some of that for your corporation tax. And if you don't, you're doing that with your eyes open because I'm mm. telling you, you know, you need to think about it. And yes, you, even running my own business, it, it, you have to be disciplined because suddenly a client, you know, pays me some money and you think oh great loads of money and you think well actually no 20 percent for vat i better side you know another 19 or 20 percent for the corporation tax and suddenly you know that's a third of it gone so what you thought was like a nice healthy sum of money is suddenly mm, <laughs> not quite as good is it i, I get page you and page one works really simple and straightforward yeah. and, you know this is what you've earned in the month yeah. this is the tax code we've been told to apply for you this is what your tax is it's just it's a mathematical equation and it's yeah. it's straightforward but when you run a business it's not it's yeah. not like that because there's so many other variables so um so from what you've just said there it's made me think of like you know with an automated system you could potentially have something that would you know you've got cash in and that allocates a percentage of right we need to cover this we need to cover this this is actual profit you know, you could potentially do something like that. Well, they do something like that in the construction industry. So um, mm. the rules are changing shortly. <laughs> um, mm. You could see this as a very sort of prejudiced way of doing things. But because it, it was felt there was a lot of cash in hand jobs in the building sector, mm. um, anybody who goes on to the build, a building site, apart from professionals like architects who are obviously, you know, Mm. proper chaps and you know would be paying their tax etc etc um 
but any sort of labourers and but anybody like that who obviously is not going to pay any of their tax at all, we, we need to get it beforehand. So what a while ago, what, what they introduced was a, um, that unless you've registered with HMRC and parcel you know, their tests, if you've got paid and you worked on a building site, 20% tax gets deducted straight away. So it's a mm. bit, it's a kind of a, a bit like being an employee but you could be self-employed you could have a company if yeah. you supplied materials 20 percent wouldn't be deducted but for the labor part yeah. whether it's your labor or your employees labor 20 percent gets deducted mm. so i've got clients that every year i know they're going to get a tax refund because mm-hmm. they work on the building building site they get 20 percent deducted yeah they get they have some costs so all the costs you know the 20 percent of all their costs they do that as a refund yeah and i and i have one who i don't understand why he doesn't knock on my door on the 6th of april and say simon here's all my stuff i want my tax return have you not done it yet is it filed when am i getting my tax return? he waits till january the government's had his money <laughs> from the 6th of april to january and it's like oh time we've had christmas i think uh, yeah i better give you this information and um, what's my refund well you know you could have had this refund back in april but whatever you know <laughs> maybe so, he's working off like if i have it because before Christmas I'll blow it off <laughs> <laughs> I think in a normal year it pays for his holiday <laughs> yeah yeah it'll be something like that it'll be like this is a quite a nice arrangement and you know no totally <laughs> so something like that is a bit brutal but it, it does work mm. what I object to on that side is that it's HMRC expects you to tell them what's yeah. been deducted and paid over they yeah. don't like it if you say to them can you tell me what's been paid over yeah what have i paid they should know <laughs> they should know because because when, when, when all the client companies have deducted the 20 percent they've got it the rules are very similar to pay as you earn that by the like the 20th 22nd or whatever they've got to pay over to hmrc all the cis all the tax they've deducted and say who it relates to so they'll have a, on a computer somewhere that big building company limited has deducted from joe blogs john smith whatever you know 200 quid this week 300 quid 400 quid whatever and it total up to ten thousand, and they've paid it over so hmrc have all that information mm. so i don't see why they can't just hand it over to the taxpayer and say this is what we think because you can imagine some people who work on building sites with vans and them keeping receipts and you know it, the summers are here and it's hot and the windows down and the paperwork is just flying out the window or you know it's hidden underneath the mcdonald's wrappers and you know whatever yeah, else yeah. yeah we've all seen those vans yeah <laughs> well i think some of us have seen those offices as well <laughs> <laughs> Are you running your own socials or do you have someone doing that for you? No, I, I, I run it myself. Okay. And, and do you do that just sort of for your own interest or are you, right, what, what's, your, what's your approach to that? Because it's kind of a thing that everyone should be seen to be doing or feels that they need to be doing and in some cases do actually need to do. I suppose I do think it's important. The trouble is there's an awful lot of accountants out there and if you Google accountants leads there's a bloodbath there's loads and i'm not prepared i can't afford to get into an arms race of pay to click Mm -hmm. um, because there'll always be somebody prepared to pay more and in the end it just goes to google a nice offshore company that doesn't pay any uk taxes so i'm not really in favor of giving them loads of money and, and uh, or whoever it is yell.com or bing or whoever because i think there just always be somebody prepared to pay more than me and mm. you know it's just yeah you, i don't think it, it's never a race you can win and some some accountants you know their national or international firms and their marketing budgets probably bigger than my turnover yeah you know? so i can't compete so i'm not trying to so it's it's just Hopefully there are no accountants listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> so I try and do. Don't, I mean, don't worry, we can always remove it. <laughs> so, so, so what's kind of worked well for me is Google reviews. Uh, yeah. 
which most accountants are pretty useless at. The uh, the legal trade is pretty good. So you'll find some legal firms in in Leeds with I don't know, four hundred reviews, mm-hmm. an awful lot of quite good firms of chartered accountants have no reviews or only have one or two reviews. So it's, and people do rely on them. Um, so oh, yeah. ASCARF, we don't have that many reviews, but they're all five star reviews. And we, we, we generally have more than most other firms. There's some on yeah. the outskirts of leads that probably equal or may slightly beat us depending on what day you look at it. But that's kind of worked well. I'm on Twitter. I think Twitter's past its peak. I use Twitter in two ways. One is just to put news articles out there that I'm vaguely interested in or I think might be relating to sectors that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Um, Occasionally, I'll also put tweets out that blow my own trumpet or whatever. But none of those have ever won me any work. What's, Mm. What's won work is by spending a bit of time looking at other people's tweets. And if someone says, oh, do you know a good accountant in Leeds? I think that's how I met you. You said, oh, I, I want to interview an accountant <laughs> in Leeds. And then, then suddenly I appear and say, there's me. <laughs> I'm an accountant. I'm in Leeds. What about interviewing me? What, you know, or do you know a good accountant? Yeah, I'm a good accountant. I know me. Talk to me. <laughs> and obviously here I am talking to you. But yeah, so I have won some work because of that. And sometimes people haven't responded. Fine. You know, they're, they're perfectly entitled to. But that's by searching, by engaging, by hunting for certain phrases, if people have asked a question out there and you find it, you know you've got somebody who is looking for an accountant in a, in Leeds. You're an accountant in Leeds. You know, yeah. open the door. And yeah, um, I find LinkedIn. I mean, I know loads of people say, oh, LinkedIn is the one to be on and, and, and you win loads of work and all of that. But when you get recommendations on LinkedIn, if someone says, oh, do you know a decent accountant? Mm. Everybody will, will recommend either their accountant or the guy, you know, the, the accountant from their B&I group who they have breakfast with once a week, regardless yeah. of whether they're any good or not. So that just kind of gets a bit overwhelming. I'm on Instagram. That's not really won any work, but it's just, I suppose I kind of like the visual aspect of it. It's, yeah. It's like when Twitter started, you, you only had 140 words. That was sometimes a challenge to be able to put something out there in 140 yeah. words. It's what, 280 now. It's less of a challenge, isn't it? Um, but yes, ha- accountants and representing what we do pictorially, it's, that's a challenge. <laughs> yeah, there's only so many photos of books you can publish. <laughs> 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 and their spreadsheets. <laughs> So, yes, that hasn't perhaps generated any work, but it doesn't take too long to do much of that. But I'm probably not very good at being sort of a general listener. So there are some people who just, you know, who, who back in the day when you could meet people, mm. they'd say, oh, yeah, I've seen you tweet or, you know, put on this picture on Instagram. And I think, but you didn't even like it. You know, you didn't mm. click like I wasn't aware that you were watching, but they clearly watch absolutely everything on their phone, but never yeah. respond to anything. Yeah. So I'm not one of those people. So I don't, I, I don't really have the time unless I'm really bored to flick through to see what everybody else has. But I've had to on Twitter put a, create a list that's a private list of just family. So occasionally I can remember just to flick through to see what my brothers, and my yeah, nephews yeah. and nieces, etc., might be up to, you know. And then <laughs> when I meet, them, I can blag. <laughs> um, but no, so I think social media, I think, has its place. It's a good way of disseminating information. I suppose it's part of building brand awareness. By me, sort of tweeting news articles it means if someone does look at our twitter account the asgarth twitter account they don't think oh this must be a dead twitter account because no one's tweeted anything Uh, since 2013 or something they can mm -hmm. see that you know today two tweets or however many it is have gone out so the business is still live and active i mean the fact they may not be interested in um i'm just trying to think what i tweeted today but (laughs) the time you broadcast that was ages ago you know (laughs) but it'll be it'll be some economic story or some about a business in a particular sector you know they may not be interested but that's irrelevant isn't it is it's it's just something on the timeline so uh do you have any 
like do you have any big retirement plans or is it too far off in the future oh it's getting closer <laughs> build up a pension pot that's <laughs> Because once you retire, that's it, isn't it? You can't. You, there's nothing more you can. You know, you, your money well, is dad, what it is. Then and yeah, I mean, uh, my dad retired a, like twice. <laughs> 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 he, he retired and then he was like, "Oh, there's not enough money there." <laughs> well, there's not enough money, but also I always say to people, everyone needs a reason to get out of bed in the morning, don't they? And I don't care hmm. necessarily what that reason is. Somebody can. In a number of retired people who said to me. You know they don't know how they coach when they're working because life's you know they're, they're too busy now they're retired to even think yeah. about working <laughs> they've obviously got a reason to get out of bed in the morning you know we might think it's a ridiculous reason but it, it motivates them so we all need that but we also need the money and the finance yeah so um i mean i quite like ska and reggae music so i'm just reading a book at the moment about a particular school in jamaica which trained a lot of the kids well into different trades and taught them a lot of music skills and a lot of them became musicians and it's just going through some of the musicians in different bands over the years and um, there's a few of them where you know they weren't paid enough they didn't get enough money the money that they probably would deserve because somebody else had the royalties or whatever yeah. and you know then life in kind of having to bus school or you know in hardship and once you got there there's nothing you can do about it is it is you can't roll the clock back and start again so um it yeah and with the uncertainty the government has of constantly pushing back the state retirement age it's um it's something we as a society we don't really like to think about but uh i don't have any great plans you know just yeah you know so there's no around the world trip or anything that you <laughs> that you wait that you're waiting for you're not going to get a sports car straight away or anything <laughs> oh gosh no no not at all, and I'm not going to go on any cruises. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know the number one thing that people buy when they win the lottery? No, go on. A dog. <laughs> 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 and there's been a bit of a dog boom as well, hasn't there, through lockdown of people who just like, oh, give me an excuse for these walks. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I can't really comment. We got a, a, a dog about a year and a half ago, but it was before. <laughs> We yeah, knew about pandemics, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I, I don't think when I get to the age of 67 or whatever state retirement age is, I'd suddenly think, oh, I must get a dog. <laughs> <laughs> That's responsibility and gosh. I know. <laughs> <laughs> right, I've had enough of that now. <laughs> <laughs> Quiet. <laughs> uh, okay. You know, so, am... but, yeah, go on. <laughs> I was just going to say, I am going to end it there, but you, like, say what you were going to say. Well, it's just, I suppose I kind of like the idea of, I suppose I've never really, yeah, I like the idea of a sort of phased retirement of, of you know, when there's been internal promotions, I've never sort of necessarily seen things being as suddenly get promoted on, you know, day one, you know, day whatever, mm. you know, people kind of grow into roles and then it's kind of acknowledged yeah. and then you get, the, you know, the title and the pay and whatever else. So maybe just slowly cutting down the days and being disciplined enough to say, right, Fridays, I don't go in and, you know, or have a bit of a portfolio career at that point and work a day here, a day there. I don't know. It's, um, or maybe that's just pie in the sky. Well, it's, I mean, it sounds reasonable enough. It's an, you know, it's a, would be a nice way to do it, you know, sort of ease down them rather have a, an abrupt stop. Yes. Yeah. No winding down, though, for you, dear listener. Abrupt stops it is. Next time on Working Hours. Who knows? It might be you, beloved listener. Who even knows if another episode will even or ever happen? I don't. But I will be doing everything I can to try to make it happen and you can help me here. Please remember to like, share and subscribe. If you are feeling it, why not become one of my first three patrons and thus become one of my favourite people ever. Also, you can and should show me your lovely mugs and feel my lugs. Feel my lugs? Also, you can and should show me your lovely mugs and fill my lugs with your melodic Yorkshire tones. That's right, loiners. Be my guest on Working Hours. If you are in Leeds or from Leeds, then get in touch now. I need you now. Like right now, like DM me as you listen to this now 
or share it to a friend you'd love to hear on this show now and get them to message me right now, like right now, like now, 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 now. Email this podcast, workinghourspod at western-studios.com with a short bio and suggestions of your availability to be my guest or send your feedback, questions, comments and queries or whatever. Time for some arbitrary rules because this is a rules run local podcast for local people. The first rule of working hours is you must tell Aloina about working hours. The second rule of working hours is you must like and share and subscribe to the show. The third rule of working hours is that if you are a loiner, then be my guest. The fourth rule of working hours is to take ownership of your work, agitate, educate, organise, and maybe get to democratise in your workplace. Also, 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 there are still 10 episodes from last year's volume, 2020, for you to explore, and the other great episodes from this year are also still available for free wherever you get your podcasts. That's it from me. What do you do, Leeds? Tell me about it. Go to western-studios.com for more information or just email workinghourspod at western-studios.com with a brief bio and some suggestions regarding your availability. Please let me know if you would wish to be anonymous on the show. If you would like to take part but you don't want to be identified, then you can send me a secure email to westernstudios at protonmail.com. Don't want your interview published right away? Fine, we can do that. You will have approval on what gets published from your interview. You can follow this show on Twitter at Western Studios 2 and on Instagram at Western underscore Studios underscore Leeds. You can support the show with a one-off donation either to Kofi, that's K-O hyphen F-I dot com forward slash working hours or via buymeacoffee.com forward slash Western Studios where you can give as much or as little as you like. If you'd really like to help out, then you can give the show regular support and help build the project and help us in meeting the goal of lasting out this decade. Subscriptions for Loiners are a pound a month. Go to www.patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash working hours pod to become a regular supporter. If you're not from Leeds and you would still like to support this show, you can join the Outlander level for five pounds a month. That's it. Now go do one amazing thing today.
The Working Hours podcast is made by Western Studios Leeds Limited. It is presented and produced by Simon Treen. This interview was recorded over Skype. Thank you to Captivate.fm for podcast hosting. The Working Hours theme was provided by Australian-based liner DJ Punk. You can hear more from Punk at soundcloud.com forward slash big time punk. If you're in Leeds and have a podcast idea that you would like to develop, please email makemypodcast at western-studios.com with some details about what you would like to achieve and let's start making your podcast a reality today. Follow Western Studios on Twitter, Instagram and linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash western hyphen studios for sporadic news on new episodes of Working Hours and for new original podcast productions that will be coming soon from Western Studios Leeds.